Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pick up right where we left off with the same level of energy and enthusiasm and vigor and history that we saw in that last panel with, uh, with the upcoming uh, guidance that we'll have here. I would encourage you all to take your seats. We've got, an up we've got a discussion about to take place on the conservation title of the Farm Bill. Uh, I feel like we've heard so many references today to all the various uh, interests, all the various uh, investments that we can expect to see in that conservation title, and really looking forward to hearing uh, what we can get from uh, this panel, uh, as well as the insights from all of you participating via Slido. And so once again, I would encourage everybody to uh, take their seats and, and let's see what we can have for an upcoming discussion here. And I, I see we've got some folks that are funneling out of the room. By all means, if you have, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the House of Representatives for the fellow C-SPAN junkies. Uh, members are advised to take their conversations off the floor. Hear ye, hear ye. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going to be diving into a conservation panel here, uh, a closer look at new innovations. And so I, I'm going to see if they actually sat down in the same order uh, that, uh, that is listed here in my script. So far, we're going to be two for two, it looks like. Uh, by gosh, they did. What a deal. So uh, joining the first on my far right, your far left, Lynn Churchma, the Conservation and Farm Bill Advisor, uh, Melinda Sepp, Vice President for Natural Solutions and Working Lands at the National Audubon Society, Dan Yeoman, Managing Director of the Soil and Water Outcomes Fund and CEO of ReHarvest, Jonathan Coppice, an Assistant Professor at the University of Illinois, and Ryan Taylor, the Director of Public Policy for Ducks Unlimited. As with all of our other speakers, more comprehensive uh, biographies are available in the QR code that you can scan there at your table. But uh, Ryan, I want to start off with, uh, with you and we'll kind of work our way uh, this, uh, this direction. In terms of the upcoming Farm Bill, uh, the conservation title within it, obviously a big focus is going to be on that title given the priorities that we're seeing from the Biden administration from many on Capitol Hill. You got 30 seconds with the House and Senate Ag Committee chairs and ranking members. The most important thing for the title from, from DU's perspective. Well, I think the most important thing for the Farm Bill title is to see what's being done in the countryside and what needs to be done in terms of conservation and work with farmers and ranchers on the goals that they have that usually revolve around the principles of soil health. And if they can work with farmers and ranchers to know what their goals are to uh, reach their long-term conservation goals, go out there and fund that and look at the pilots that groups have done around the country at a local level to see what's working in terms of cover crops, livestock integration, uh, things to armor the soil and, and sequester carbon, and then they'll be okay. Jonathan, your thoughts. The, the headline issue from your perspective on the upcoming conservation title consideration. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's not an easy question to answer. I, I, I would say if there's one thing that, and as a unrepentant history geek, uh, and have spent probably more time than sanity should allow, kind of going through a lot of this, uh, of what we've done in the past, the one thing is we need to really, some creativity, a, a chance to start looking beyond some of the basics that we have done over and over and over, and really start to rethink some of the things, particularly around conservation, and the challenges at the farm level, uh, as we're seeing all too uh, prominently now, get creative. Can we find other ways to help get to these goals that are just not the same old ideas we've had over and over? Dan, your thoughts? Uh, the number one thing we would say is not just the amount of funding, but how that funding is distributed. And changing the mindset from cost share and grants and a pay for pr practice mentality to procuring outcomes and paying for outcomes. I think the number one most helpful thing would, and, and this, this applies to all programs really would say, let's put $100 million towards or 100 million metric tons of carbon or a million pounds of nitrogen and we will pay for verified outcomes and then let the market decide how to most efficiently get those. So you're working this public-private partnership that so many people have talked about, uh, but those dollars are going to where you get the biggest impact. Yeah, so real quickly, I'd like to lift up something Ryan said, which is learning lessons from the field. You know, Audubon is an implementing partner of multiple RCPP projects, and we feel like there's a lot of really good feedback that we've learned from how the program is actually working. And coming back to another point from the panel before us, actually, we put out a report in June of last year that looked at the overlay between natural climate solutions, so where you can store significant amounts of carbon and where priority bird habitats are. Not shockingly, there's a lot of overlap. These aren't necessarily two completely different things. We can focus on both of these and really make sure that our conservation programs are doing good work at scale for landscapes in the field. Lynn, uh, last but not least. Um, one thing I'd like to leave with all of you, and we look at uh, conservation, 
and we know we've got some hammers that we apply to uh, producers that don't do what we say is the right thing. But I think what we need to look at in conservation is let's send a, incentivize rather than penalize and think of more programs, more ways that we can help producers do the right thing. And I know we talked about regionality or that was talked about earlier today. And uh, having been at USDA at the national level and, and working in the Senate on farm bills, you know, agriculture really is regional. And it's really hard to come up with a policy that one size fits all. And I think one other thing that's critically important right now with agriculture, and this was brought up, I think Phil Brasher mentioned, uh, how do we measure? And that comes back to ag data. How do we know the billions of dollars we're spending on conservation on any of these programs are really doing what they want, what we want them to do? I remember George Vandell from the Game Fish and Parks in South Dakota used to tell me when I first started working on the farm bill, uh, said we have a million and a half acres of CRP in South Dakota, but we need a million for good habitat. And I think that's where we need to really, gives us an example of how we really need to be able to measure what we're doing in ag data. And that was a part of the last farm bill, and I think there'll be a bill introduced for this farm bill. But it's something that's really, really critical. Lynn, I'm going to borrow uh, Jeff's question uh, that he asked of um, most everyone he's spoken to today. The 2014, or excuse me, the 2018 Farm Bill was Farm Bill number what for you? Uh, that was number six for me. Number six for you, okay. And I, and I know we've got a, a lot of Farm Bill experience here, including uh, Jonathan, who loves Farm Bill so much, he literally wrote the book on them, and, and, and we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that later. But, Lynn, I was wondering if you could just kind of walk us through perhaps some of the political backdrops that we're looking at in terms of interest in conservation programs, interest in conservation spending. It seems as if there, there is a certain level of bipartisan interest in beefing up those programs and seeing what they can, you know, seeing what tweaks could be done at the ground level. Has it always been that way? And, and, and how, how have you seen changes over the years? Um, I started out as a CED back for ASCS in uh, 1985. And uh, as Chairman Peterson mentioned, the 1985 Farm Bill, when we had CRP, implemented, uh, when you started implementing it in 1986, prior to that, it was, we had a real supply problem as far as oversupply. And uh, CRP was designed to basically help eliminate that supply, which is why we had 45 million acres. And I think of the millions of dollars I spent just in Moody County, South Dakota, or oversaw with the grain reserve. And, and uh, at that time, you know, our, our grain, our sealing grain, our government CCC programs were the biggest part of the expenditures in the office. But uh, as far as, you know, we've seen conservation programs expand. We've seen CRP go from a basic program to many facets, and uh, as well as many of the others and new programs put in. And I think we really need to take a look at the conservation programs. I was visiting with a gentleman earlier today, and he said, how do we come up with new programs? We've got a lot of the same people. We've got kind of the same ones, different areas, both in the commodity groups and on the committees. And uh, you know, how can we come up with a new farm bill and I, or new ideas in the farm bill? And I think that's advice I have for any of the staffers that are listening to this or that are watching this. Um, don't be afraid to come up with new ideas, no matter how silly they might sound or how much uh, somebody might say, well, that's never going to fly. Get it out there, get people talking about it, and you'd be surprised what comes to the top. You mentioned those new ideas. Dan, I want to bring you into the fold here. Do we need new ideas? Do we need more money for the existing ideas? Do we need both? Your thoughts? Well, let me focus on the new ideas. Uh, if you just take the existing funding that exists today and think about how to allocate the, that funding in a more efficient way, certainly there's lots of opportunities. Um, and I mentioned this pay for outcomes approach or this public-private partnership approach. You know, I think one trend that's been hit on here is uh, the demand for conservation is not just coming from the public sector. It's, 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 there's a really big private sector push that's emerged over the last maybe five or so years. And so there's private and public sector who are looking to further these goals of conservation. But another point around conservation is not just conservation, it's not just climate, it is about risk mitigation, it's, it is about additional rev revenue streams for farmers, and it's, it's got to be flexible, and it's uh, got to be farmer first and farmer designed. So if you take the existing funding and allocate that in a different way or distribute it in a different way, 
And we think distributing it in the way of paying for outcomes or putting a target out there and having aggregators, developers, farmers come in to say, what's the most efficient way to get to that outcomes? It's been shown that you can have a lot more impact at a lower cost for both the public and the private sector. Jonathan, Chairman Peterson was up here saying he doesn't anticipate uh, a lot of new money uh, being, being infused into the farm bill. Um, I, I, I mean, whether or not the, that question is going to be answered probably is uh, for folks other than us, but the existing dollars that are in place, are there ways to leverage throughout the entirety of the farm bill maybe and not just within the conservation title, are there ways to leverage the available dollars to pursue some of these new outcomes that folks are interested in? I think there are, and I and I like to hear Lynn. You know, it's not just the academic saying to uh, to go out and, and get creative. It is. There's what roughly 20 billion in the baseline across Title One crop insurance and conservation, and what I think is you start to think through. You know, the, the myriad dials, the myriad way these programs are are designed. You got to operate in the CBO baseline environment. You're stuck with the funding that the Congressional Budget Office says is there. So how do you work that through? How do you get? Um, some of the risk management. I mean, these, these are themes throughout this. And so I think there are ways to do it. Um, I agree with Lynn. It needs creativity. A lot of people to, you know, be willing to gen up some bad ideas, see what happens, and then work through it as you kind of pull in what the farmers need to see, what the customers, the consumers, and all of that. So there's, there's opportunities there. And there is funding there to work on it, even if it's not bringing in the new, a new baseline uh, chunk of money. Is, is the funding and the innovation available within the conservation title, or, or do you think there needs to be conservation more throughout the Farm Bill, as, as you know, given, the, given the, uh, the amount of focus that there seems to be on Capitol Hill and the administration and the private sector, et cetera? Again, I think you can find conservation throughout, or you can pull these things together, almost hybrid-type policies. If we're going to talk about um, things like reference prices, you know, what, what more can we get uh, out of conservation around reference prices or around the myriad pieces of an ARC County program. There's a lot to that where you wouldn't necessarily have to have a baseline hit to be able to say, okay, let's, let's incentivize. Let's incentivize the competition at the ground level and farmers are very good competitors. Let's get them competing not just for yields, but also for some of the benefits and outcomes that, that they can produce per acre and really see how that takes off. And I think you can do that. It's just gonna not be easy. Melinda, when, when you hear Jonathan talk about those, those incentives, the, those ideas for conservation throughout the Farm Bill, what jumps to mind for you? Yeah, I was actually thinking about the research title. I'll admit I kind of right, quickly go. Um, there's really great applied and basic research that happens and also all of the extension work that I don't know about folks in the room, but I remember growing up there was just, you know, the extension agent was part of your community. They really helped with kind of day-to-day -day, um, big changes and decisions that you were working on. And I think about a lot of the work that probably Audubon and other um, NGOs and partners have really leaned into doing, and some of that is really what would have been under the vision of extension. Um, so yes to everything Jonathan said, and also I'd, I'd lift up the research and extension components too. So Ryan, I, I understand that DU has been taking part in, in some of that research and, and in some of those on-the-ground trials that, uh, that, uh, that Melinda just mentioned there. What, uh, what has the on-the-ground experience that DU has been uh, pushing to you know, pursue, what have you all learned from, from, that, from that research? Well, what we've learned, I think, is, is as we hire agronomists and, and send our biologists out, is to just talk to producers, like I said before, about what they need and what helps them fulfill their conservation goals. And, and when we've done that, we've been able to take some state programs from like an outdoor heritage fund at a state level and, and find out that we want to make CRP uh, more productive as working lands by adding fences and water structures so that we add livestock there. Um, they're getting a benefit of that and it's good for the habitat, it's good for the ducks, we maintain wetlands. Um, we can go out and, and uh, help with cost, cost share on cover crops. And, and maybe these are things that we can emphasize in the farm bill that we've learned locally now that cover crops, armoring the soil, helping filter the water before it gets to the wetlands is, is also a positive. Um, we want to learn more about those wetland soils. Uh, DU got to be the uh, lead uh, partner on a USDA grant for research on the climate mitigation uh, uh, value of, of wetlands on CRP grounds. So, so I think maybe one way to get more bang for our buck as we look at the conservation title and other places for conservation is um, make it easy for, for others, whether it's in the NGO world or others uh, in conservation, to, to assist and be part of that assistance and, and help with farmers and ranchers, whether we take out engineers, agronomists, biologists, 
and uh, help, help work the ground with all those folks. I remember a month, month and a half ago now, I had the chance to talk to Adam Putnam, the, the CEO of, of DU, and he told me that uh, in, his, uh, in his tenure at DU, he had hired more agronomists than he had waterfowl biologists. Uh, that, that, I mean, that's just something that kind of struck me a little bit, an organization like DU looking to work so much in, in the, the carbon sequestration and, and soil health arena. As, as you do, I, I mean, as you do these projects, what, you know, with the lens of the upcoming Farm Bill reauthorization, what, what do you all need and what do producers need to help? If programs like, like DU's are, are going to be the model and kind of that private sector involvement, what can the Farm Bill do to kind of infuse some, infuse some ability for you all to do more work like this? Well, I think a lot of the programs are in place and, and you can look at how they, uh, uh, how they are maybe simplified and streamlined to make sure that others can work in that space and obviously have uh, you know, appropriate accountability, but also make it flexible enough that it can go to work and, and put more dollars on the ground and, and less in the paperwork and the time involved to, to get the authorization so that you can actually do good things that, that are good for habitat, but also good for agriculture and profitability on the land as, as well as uh, what we want to achieve in terms of climate. Lynn, the, the, the thought behind uh, private sector involvement in, in some of these government conservation programs, government conservation initiatives, is this an opportunity for a, you know, in, an investment in a public-private partnership, or is this an example of perhaps you know, the government not staffing itself adequately and, and, and further investment needed in that area as well? I, I think uh, having a, a public-private uh, sector involvement, uh, you know, we've got a lot of great organizations out there and uh, they've got dollars to spend, and we've got these conservation programs. We've, the zero baseline farm bill has come up uh, several times today. So I think any time we can leverage more dollars into these programs without making them too competitive to beginning farmers with general production agriculture. When I, several years ago when I was policy initiatives manager for the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, I told the folks on the team there, you know, the number one thing with a farmer or a rancher is to make money. They've got to be able to sustain that farm. They've got to feed their family. They've got to keep their operation going. They aren't going to be interested in a conservation program unless they can make money. And the most important thing I think we can remember in any farm bill is to complement conservation and production agriculture. And while we're speaking of money, can I tell the folks how to get an extra billion dollars for the farm bill? I don't think anyone here would be opposed to that, no. Okay. This was something that uh, in the last Farm Bill, uh, Senator Thune had introduced legislation for and doing some research. And you can thank Jonathan Coppice for this because I think I got it from some research the University of Illinois did. If we would do a mandatory base update, that would save, according to CBO, that would save about a billion dollars. You know, we've got a lot of base acres out there that have been planted to grass for years and years, and yet they're still getting a payment on those acres. And you know, and I know it's not popular. And one thing I learned in administering commodity title programs was there are three things farmers value the most. Their wife, kids, and base acres, not necessarily in that order. But uh, you know, it's a touchy subject, but there is a real savings there, and I think it would be much better policy. Well, and, and, and w the root of policy is the politics. You, you, you know, you discuss the, the political, um, you know, pushback uh, that in put a political involvement that conservation programs have had in farm bills over the years. But, you know, walk us through, because I, I remember seeing the farm bill markup for that, for that, what would become the 2018 legislation. And I remember there's, there were some initiatives that, that you and Senator Thune were, were pursuing that perhaps did not go the, the direction that, uh, that you all were hoping. What needs to be done to get the bipartisan bicameral support that that would be needed to produce you know pursue some of the wholesale changes that we're discussing up here what needs to be done to get folks on board enough to stick their necks out on the line and, and vote for what you're vote for what you're all asking for here i th i think uh, as been as has been brought out before just good open communication and honest discussions and bipartisan discussions on what's really good policy and what's the right thing uh, if we can start there, and also one thing I've always said, uh, being a farmer myself, farmed for 15 years full-time before I ever started working for USDA, but uh, the best ideas for farm policy don't come from behind a desk in Washington. They come from out in the field, come from the farmers and ranchers and the people that actually have their hands on what they're doing. 
Well, Linda, earlier in the discussion, you had mentioned the RCPP projects that uh, that uh, your your outfit is is working with. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your involvement in that program and perhaps ideas that you might have for Capitol Hill, given given your involvement in RCPP and, and, and what you'd like to see from that going forward. Yeah, somehow after leaving the Hill last year, I've got even more ideas now than I did when I was there. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll take half a step back and just talk a little bit about Audubon Works in a host of different ways. One of them is by delivering RCPP as a primary and sometimes as a supporting participant. And then we also really seek to collaborate with private landowners and land managers. So we do a lot of outreach and collaboration with folks like private certified foresters to think about bird-friendly habitat on privately owned forest land. We work kind of, um, like Ryan mentioned before, we work around con uh, conservation forage program in North Dakota, really thinking about grassland restoration uh, and quality habitat and grasslands as grazing lands. And we also work through our CPPs with folks like the dairy producers in California around tricolored blackbird habitat and we're working on one of the big AFA awards on um, soil carbon and ranching, uh, well, soil carbon monitoring on ranches. And part of what we found is really, you know, we are at this, I would say, kind of precipice where a lot really needs to happen at scale fairly quickly, both for habitat and wildlife and also for climate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience work. And part of the real lesson learned, I think, for us through our CPP has been that it's great because it is more creative than other programs, but perhaps it's still a little too slow. Um, and some of that, I think, will be going into the next Farm Bill and really thinking back to Jonathan and Lynn's point around how can we be creative so that we can think of some programs, whether it's our CPP or something else, as ways to go pilot and learn things to then inform and feedback into broader program administration. Very good. I want to turn to a question submitted on Slido, and as I do that, would encourage all of you, if you have questions for this uh, illustrious panel, uh, by all means, I, I'm sure you'd rather hear your thoughts than mine. Uh, feel free to submit them uh, here, here on Slido. Question was submitted uh, about, and I'm going to open this up to whoever up here would like to take it. What is the role of research and data to make the case for conservation investments? What, what is that role, do we think? Well, I think what you find from the research is going to be what you sell to, to the taxpayer, obviously, and, and people that are wanting a, a, a climate that's under control and, and an environment that uh, has habitat for their re recreation or, or anything else that they want to do. So, so you, you've got to have that, I think, as to sell the program at, at some point. Now, even without number outcomes, there's still benefits that, that we get that are going to be hard to quantify, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's uh, uh, ability to, you know, um, uh, just kind of have a, a landscape that, that's going to be in balance. And, and we think about a couple things that when I think about that is that uh, we just had a collaboration with uh, Certified Angus Beef, and, and one of the things they say is that they're in the business of high quality beef, but one of the byproducts of that is high quality habitat. So even without data, sometimes you're doing something that's creating a benefit, uh, whether it's for water or cities or anything that might not have a number associated with it. Um, also, real quickly, I think that research and data also helps us tell the story. So kind of picking up a thread that Ryan just mentioned, like, you know, for folks who are out in the field implementing projects or managing your land, there's a story to that that just is intuitive, right? It's what you see, it's how, it, it's how the landscape feels. And the research and data side really helps connect that into a either landscape scale or kind of countrywide scale narrative and story about one, why those investments are so important, and two, connects folks who live outside of that landscape to the work being done there. I'm obviously not an objective observer on this. The more investment in research, I think, the better. Uh, but I do want to thank those comments and also just sort of add a little bit on that, which is that research is not a one-off and it is a long, time, long-term investment, and we have got to do more of it, we've got to do better, and I think something that Melinda just said is key, not just outside of agriculture, but think about students coming to the universities, where are they coming from and what do they want to study, and so the research ca uh, capacities, that, what you're getting knowledge and ability through is, is key, and so again, I realize I'm not an objective observer on this, but it is really an important investment, and we have seen it play out for hundreds of years of what we've re, uh, invested in our research, so it's key. So we talk about uh, perhaps an increased investment in, in conservation research. Dan, the, what, are, what are the answers you would like to see answered if, if, uh, if that increased uh, investment does take place? What are, the, what are the targets that you would have for that research? 
Well, I think some uh, earlier panel talked about is on the protocols and certification side around the outcomes that are generated from a lot of these conservation practices. And I think a lot of corporations who have these very large scope three or supply chain emission goals, um, we have a lot of corporations that are really out in front and starting to spend big dollars because they have very aggressive targets. We have a lot that are still on the sidelines because of the lack of protocols or certifications around, hey, if, if we invest money for conservation practices that deliver outcomes, uh, without those clear protocols, how do we know that in the future those protocols won't be confirmed or set up and our investment won't be recognized by the SBTI and other bodies that, that track, these, um, track these targets? So support around not just the research of the practices themselves, but around the protocols and how to measure the impact of those practices. I think that guidance coming from USDA or at least aligning all the different verifiers out there in a, in a uh, and a set of protocols would be really helpful to unlocking even more funding come from both public and private sector. You mentioned some of the some of the private sector and, and some of the, the business community investments. Are are those folks out ahead of producers in terms of practices, or are, are they finally catching up to producers, do you think? Uh, in terms of the investments they're making? Well, the investments they're making and the practices that they're calling for in, in some of their sustainability goals, some of their sustainability metrics, things that they're looking for from, you know, from a procurement standpoint. Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, I think for most corporations, carbon is front and center, and CO2 equivalents is front and center. Um, there are some corporations and a lot of public agencies at the local, state, and federal level thinking about other co-benefits such as water quality. And there's billions of dollars going into water quality that some, for some reason, don't necessarily talk to the carbon side in the private sector yet. Um, and I think for those corporations, it's not necessarily how, they're, they're focused on the outcomes to meet their targets. The means to get there, uh, I think most corporations would say we're, we're flexible. And if you can measure it and it's recognized, then let's do what's best for the producer, let's do what's best for the farmer, let's make sure there's flexibility in that program. Um, and I think like any program, there's, there's folks that are really far, far out in, in advance or maybe been, been doing these practices uh, for a long time. There's a lot of folks that are earlier on in that conservation journey, both at the corporate level and from the farmer level um, perspective. So uh, I think you need a program that fits for both those early adopters, those that are out in front, and, and, and also those that are just begin beginning that conservation journey. Lynn, you mentioned your experience as a producer, and that's why I want to go to you with this question submitted by uh, Alex Eccles. How do we improve the efficiency of conservation delivery by USDA uh, to create a higher environmental ROI? Uh, what's, what's the low-hanging fruit to improve that efficiency, do you think? Well, I think one thing uh, would certainly help. I, on my farm, I signed up for Conservation Stewardship Program, CSP, and found, and I had tremendous help from the county NRCS office, but that is a very cumbersome, arduous process to go through, probably more so than any other program that uh, I've been involved in. So I think a couple things. One, simplify the application process, and I know that's easier said than done. And then also, we need more money for technical assistance. I think that's the low-lying fruit as far as get the help out there. If we're going to have these programs and we're going to make them work, we've got to have the adequate assistance. I would have never been, gone, been able to get through that application if I hadn't had two visits out to the farm from NRCS to help me walk through it and going back and forth. Uh, and if they hadn't been there, I wouldn't have been able to qualify. I uh, wouldn't have been able to probably complete my application adequately. And I think in one of the House uh, Ag Committee hearings, they said there's only like 25 or 30 percent uh, CSP applications that are actually approved that are priority. Well, they were extremely helpful in setting up the priority. So I think that's something, a couple things that are really, really important. Ryan, your thoughts on, on the possible benefit that uh, might be observed through, uh, through increased investment in technical assistance? Well, I think that that's obvious, uh, you know, as, as Lynn mentioned, and, and I want to think of one that's kind of held up as a real successful project for DEU is the Rice Stewardship Partnership in the uh, six rice producing states where I think the technical assistance kind of comes not only from DU but the other partner organizations there because these, even in an RCPP grant, can be uh, sometimes cumbersome. But when they brought the expertise together, they can really make the practices work. And now all of a sudden you have habitat for ducks while maintaining water efficiency for the rice farmers and producing the crop that they need while giving waterfowl the calories they need to make their migration and, and really improve uh, uh, the environment. 
I'm going to paraphrase a question uh, submitted here uh, that asks about uh, something similar, but wondering what you all see as the role of conservation programs in the context of disaster preparedness and, rec and recovery. Is, is this a potential area where the Farm Bill could, you know, perhaps, you know, we, we've heard some folks, uh, including uh, former Chairman Peterson, talk about looking for that permanent disaster uh, program, but is, is this, is the role of conservation programs, could that potentially be something to uh, address that, uh, that further disaster mitigation uh, preparedness and response? Well, just I'll throw in a couple things just because we, we do some work, obviously a lot of work with water, and, and when you have wetlands on the landscape, you're not only cleaning the water that cities may need to use, you're also mitigating floodwaters that could cause a lot of damage. So I think there's, con there's definitely a tie between conservation and, and disaster preparedness. Uh, um, parts of the country that are going through a drought right now, and we had a very severe one, I probably didn't know it going into it on our own ranch, but as I was building watering sites over the years through EQIP, uh, now all of a sudden I was in a D4 drought and every one of my pastures had clean water available for the livestock that had I not been doing those conservation practices over the last 10 years, I would not have had. So, so in a very local disaster, I was prepared for it. So we have resiliency, which I think is going to be a, a big benefit. Lynn, you look like you were about to chime in there. Uh, coming from South Dakota where we have more cows than people in the state, grasslands are incredibly important. Grasslands are incredibly important as far as habitat. And one thing I've looked at for several years and been approached about uh, this past year is the taking a look at the crop insurance program that we have for grasslands, for rangeland. And I know there's some good products out there, but you know, all the years I met with producers and they said my banker won't let me farm without purchasing crop insurance. Well, I don't know that I met any cattlemen that said my banker won't let me operate without having uh, either the PRF, Pasture Rangeland Forage, or NAP, or whatever uh, program, other program is available. And I think something we need to look at, or that I would suggest looking at, is how can we improve crop insurance for the uh, rangeland and grassland? I think that would certainly help mitigate disaster risk. If, if there were a product out there that were comparable to what's available to commodity producers, under insurance, I think that could have a, a great effect as well as, you know, we do have the livestock forage program, which doesn't cost anything to uh, participate. If we could replace that with an insurance program where we could actually get a premium from the producer and it was a premium that paid off like our, uh, give us the risk management that our commodity crop insurance does, I think that would be a good trade off. I'll, I'll say if, if disaster relief is an intention in the Farm Bill, recommendation is just be intentional about it and define what, what the objective is and how you're going to measure it. And whether it's water scarcity in the West or flooding in the Midwest or some of these other disasters, uh, I don't think you'll get to the outcomes. You might spend more money but not get to what you're trying to get to unless you're intentional defining objectives and you're measuring those objectives and then paying for those rel relative to those objectives. Got, uh, got a few more minutes here, uh, but do want to ask a question submitted by Kendall Jones at ProAg. Uh, wondering, you know, Lynn, you had mentioned the, the base acre update, uh, you know, as a potential uh, avenue to consider. Uh, I, I'd like to, you know, just open this up to anyone who might be interested. Any thoughts on, on programs that uh, either need a, a similar uh, update uh, or, you know, maybe the ceasing uh, of, of such programs might be a good idea. Any, uh, <laughs> any such programs in the conservation title uh, jump to mind in terms of things that are maybe uh, due for uh, major reform or maybe due for, uh, you know, maybe removal from the bill? Um, I'd like to build off something that uh, Chairman Roberts talked about he was talking about CRP, he said we need to get the worst ground into CRP and farm the rest. Well, when we look at the CRP payment structure, what do we pay the most money for? It's for the best land. And we pay the least for the poorest land. So maybe we ought to take a look at CRP, and uh, I would like to see this even as a pilot project. Maybe we should pay more for the poorer ground, make sure that gets put into the program, and farm the rest, make sure there's more of the good land farm instead of just the opposite. So I know that's a kind of a wild idea, but I think it has merit. Well, we're, we're at a point in time for wild ideas. Uh, and <laughs> let's, uh, let's hear that. Jonathan, you look like you're about ready to chime into something there. Well, I don't know. Lynn's already blamed me for a, a mandatory base update, so I'm not sure how much trouble I can get myself into uh, in one short stretch. Um, I, I don't necessarily know that it's, that it's an elimination question. I, I do like 
And we've heard talk about RCPPs, the, the thinking about across programs. We, we, we bucket and silo these things and they get stuck there. And, and so I think there is maybe less of an issue of getting rid of, but how do we, again, get creative beyond that? So particularly on working lands, thinking about risk management, thinking about the, the support system more broadly with conservation in it. And you, meant, you asked the, the question about, um, you know, is conservation a disaster and, and risk? Well, not if there's massive backlogs, people can't get signed up and get in the program. It's, so we've got to find a way to incorporate that so we don't have the same disaster situation. And Lord knows when climate change brings the whatever it brings, that kind of thinking forward is going to be so critical. So I, I do I know baseline budget challenges and whatnot, but I think from a working lands perspective, a disaster perspective, we've got to think of how we incorporate conservation because that's the way to do it on the ground. And it may not just be through the usual alphabet soup of programs. Jonathan, I want to go back to, to you, and this is probably going to be our, our last question. So after Jonathan uh, you know, responds, I would invite the rest of you to do so as well. But wondering the, the role that you see in terms of financial institutions as well as federal investments, a question submitted by an anonymous uh, you know, submittee, wondering how can financial institutions and federal agencies like FSA, RMA, and NRCS support or provide incentive for the implementation of conservation programs? That financial incentive, any, any you know, Lynn says he's got to create idea any creative ideas from your part here <laughs> I, I don't have one right on the spot again I, but I do think the financial institutions I do think um, you know we talk about beginning farmers and the ability for for innovation to happen at the farm level and in the field and on the ground so to the extent the financial institution can think about um, you know helping that along and and working with those with those producers I think they do a, a lot of work there I, you know I don't know if there's a I don't have like a specific you know, financial instrument idea, although that would be fascinating if somebody could come up with one that really pulled in some of the private funding and invested in, in this longer term. Because again, we're talking about longer term investments and the challenge is that year, as we just are seeing right now, that year to year risk uh, situation is brutal when you're trying to do five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 year uh, work on the field. Yeah, from, from financing innovation, um, there's two things we need to solve for. One is the funding on the back end for when these conservation practices are implemented and produce results that I think everyone here wants, and including the farmer. And then the financing innovation to provide the working capital to implement those practices. So uh, for financial institutions, and, and we deal with these financial institutions all the time, and by the way, I'd say the biggest impact investor or investor out there is state revolving funds. They have billions of dollars and now even more money coming from, from the EPA, and more and more SRF funds are interested in how do we support water quality, not just at the point source, but on farms, is flexible, long-term financing that then is, ba is backed by purchase agreements either from corporations and or the USDA or EPA that's, that are buying verified either carbon, water quality, or biodiversity, or whatever outcomes they're trying to strive for. And if you have those purchase agreements, the financing is easy because those financial institutions need to be paid back. So if you have purchase agreements, and that works. And, that, and that, those, those, those models exist today. It's a question, I think, of awareness and how to scale those up. And, and within those, the enrolling in those programs has to be really easy. And I'll just see what's a killer for innovation is rules, eligibility restrictions, and com complexity for the farmer. So you have to have turnkey, easy solutions um, that compensate the farmer and cover their costs to implement these practices, but also measures the results that then others will pay for, both private and public sector, because they value those results. Um, so there are some couple ideas. An encouraging sign uh, to you actually has had a regenerative ag conference with a, with a major lender in, uh, back in North Dakota. And so I think we're starting to see lenders take a real interest in, in their customers' long-term success which some lenders realize is, is going to include regenerative ag or incorporating soil health principles, and they hopefully have to realize that those soil health principles don't result in uh, uh, product next year. It might be three years, five years, ten years from now in terms of what you've been able to improve, reduce inputs, maybe have your own nutrients coming into the ground that isn't you know, commercially bought and paid for. Uh, so I think uh, at some point there may even be uh, customers within the, their operating loans that have a have a uh, part of a point break on their on their operating loan potentially. So, yeah, and real quickly connecting that in with the research data and extension side to make all of that work on the monitoring, the verification, the metric side, and also the storytelling side for the investment community. Um, we talked about 
earlier today uh, discussions about producers, the first ones are the ones that have been applying conservation practices, doing no-till, uh, cover crops, uh, all sorts of things, that how do we reward them instead of saying, well, you've already done it, you don't get anything now, we've got this new guy who's not been doing a good job. I think one thing we could look at is, and this would have to be done at the farm level or tract level, which actually, if it were in place, would make that land worth more. You can't do it if I'm Lynn and I've got a thousand acres and I've done it for five years, and then I'd let, I get rid of that thousand acres and have another thousand. That practice has helped the land. It's also helped me, but that would need to stay with the land. We could incentivize that by allowing a higher reference price target or a tar higher reference price or loan rate or even a higher subsidy on the crop insurance premium on that land that has had those practices installed. So I think that's one way that we could uh, help out in that respect. So a lot of creativity, a lot of ideas exchanged here. Uh, obviously the conservation title going to be one to watch uh, here as Congress looks to reauthorize the 2023 Farm Bill. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Well, folks, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, my boss, uh, Sarah Wyant, up to the stage. But before we do that, uh, a video and, and our thanks to a gold level sponsor, uh, Nature's Alpine Solutions. American agriculture is renowned the world over. We feed the world and lead the world in our agricultural technology and productivity. Much of that is thanks to our American farmer. However, overfertilization can cause problems like algae blooms and other related issues that result from excessive nutrients, such as phosphorus runoff. The increased occurrence of these problems calls for a different, better way to fertilize. This is one reason specialty liquid fertilizers are the best choice. Specialty liquid fertilizers are better environmentally and better economically due to improved utilization and efficiency. Dry fertilizers currently make up over 90% of the market. They are applied to wide areas and require water to break down into food for seeds or plants. This means that much of the fertilizer runs off and never feeds the crops. Specialty liquid fertilizers are precision placed with infuro or foliar applications. With specialty liquid fertilizers, farmers can feed seeds and plants immediately, leading to higher yields due to their efficiency. Precision placement of high quality specialty liquid fertilizers translates to a more economical solution for the farmer and greater, quicker utilization potential for the plant. Greater plant uptake means less chance of off-target movement to lakes, waterways, streams, and aquifers. Clearly, a better environmental solution. The time has come for better policy, legislation that supports farmers who want to make the right choice for their families, for our communities, for the earth. We need to help our farmers, the original conservationists, feed a growing planet. Let's work together to create incentives to support our farmers and the benefits of using precision-placed specialty liquid fertilizers.